All right. So hopefully that was a blessing that you uh, are getting this from. Look, I, I had no idea where we were going to go today. I'm glad it went where it did because I think it was really important and really powerful. And uh, hopefully we can get this. I know, and I've told this to a lot of people, you're either going to be able to hear this, receive it, and get excited about it, or you'll end up quitting and walking away because you don't want to hear it anymore. It's a filter. You could ask my wife. I said that to her 20-something years ago when we first started out. I said, this is a filter, this teaching that Abba gives me to do. People are either going to be okay and get it and be excited about it, or they're just going to get tired of hearing it. Because you can't hear this and not do it and keep hearing it. At some point, you're either going to have to start doing it, or you're going to just walk away because you don't want to hear it anymore. And so that's okay. It is what it is. But if we're going to be honest, it is the problem. Okay, oh no, but I want to hear about Daniel and what's going on with this whole thing with the end time. Listen, if you can't figure this out, none of that's going to help you any. I don't know why it's so hard for you to get that. I don't know why people struggle with that. None of that stuff is going to be of any use to you if you can't figure this out. It's going to play out however it plays out, whether you know it or not. One day Yeshua will be here and you may be surprised because you didn't figure it out. Well, who cares? What shouldn't be a surprise is him saying, well, now I'm, I'm looking at you and wondering, why do you still do what you're doing? He might say, and you're like, well, I don't know. I didn't know when you were coming. I was focused on trying to figure that out. You should be focused. Listen, he says to me, and that's what I get from him all the time, teach them what they need to do and they'll be where they need to be. Okay? That's it. And by the way, doing is not just the mechanics. Doing is loving his authority. Doing is submitting as a servant and a slave to him from a loving point of view, or trusting him. The doing is all of that. Belief and action together, like James tells us in chapter 2 of James, right? I'll show you my belief through my actions. That's all Abba wants to do is see your belief through your actions. Everything else, he's got that. It'll be fine. It'll play out the way it's supposed to. End of story. You don't need to figure the rest of that out. I'm not telling you it's wrong to try. I'm just saying is if that's the most focus and you're not focusing on getting your relationship right, getting the covenantal, he said you do part right, the rest of it matters zero. It's of no use. And until you embrace that, you're still going to be like, oh, I have people tell me all the time, well, you know, Rabbi, I listen to all your teachings, but, you know, is there anything you can recommend? I want to get, I want to get deeper. Have you gotten what I've taught you yet? Oh, no, I've heard. No, have you gotten it? Are you doing it? Why do you need deeper? What's deeper than everything I throw at you that you need at this point? I'm not saying not. I'm saying, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not trying to tell you not listen to anybody else. I'm not trying to tell you whatever. I'm just saying is I wonder, because I know you when you come to me, and I'm looking at you going, you don't have this down, why do you need deeper? That's an ego, whatever thing going on. I just, it's an intellectual thing. I just want to dig into it. I, I think maybe I need to go take Hebrew classes and Greek classes. And I need, this is for the simple, right? He said the simple. He gives understanding to the simple. Keep it simple. You do not need to understand Hebrew and Greek and be a scholar to understand this. And you were supposed to have a teacher. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that if you have the time that you shouldn't go and do these things, but let's focus. Look, when you go to college, remember in college, there was your major, and then you could take minors, or there were electives. But were you supposed to spend all of your time on your electives or on your major? Okay? Because if you focused on the electives, you were going to be lousy at your major. Let those other things be electives. Don't make it the major. How do you know which is which? Which one do you spend your time doing the most? That's the thing that's consuming you the most. That to you is now the major. And then what we do is we major in the minors, as they say. Okay? That's an old saying. You've all heard that. This is simple. Yet the simple seems so hard to do. And it's hard to do because you're the one trying to do it. <laughs> it's the you part that's trying to do it. And stop trying to do it. Be it. Okay? 
Don't be a human doing, be a human being Torah observant. All right? I'm just saying. And if you haven't gotten there yet, which none of you have, what else do you need? I don't understand. Why do you need deeper? What does that mean anyway? Well, I need deeper. Do you know, and I say this with all humility, I don't think any of you fully understands anything I've taught yet. I'm serious. I can sit down with you and explain things that right, I can go through the same teaching you heard, play it back, and point to things, and you'll be like, oh, how did I miss that? Okay, I say this with full humility. You don't even understand fully what I've taught you. Okay? You can, that's why you can go back and listen to it again. How many of you have listened to a teaching more than five times? Okay, the fifth time, did you get something out of it you never saw the other four times? Proves my point. Okay? So what do you need deeper? It's already in front of you. Listen to it again. You just haven't understood it yet. It's in layers. It's, in, it's him, not me. He speaks in layers. He speaks in depths of, of layers of things that as you listen to it, oh, the light bulb starts to go on. And then more and then more. I demonstrated this. I had no idea I was doing it. The one time we did the Heart of the Matter Challenge and the first 12 parts or so, I did a, on, on Marco Polo, I gave a director's cut. I listened to the part with everybody else and then I gave my own little, what I got out of re-listening to my own teaching. And the people going, he said that? <laughs> that was in there? But I'm just telling you, you don't even fully understand what was already in there. And that's not insulting. I'm not talking down to you. As you progress and grow, you go back and you'll get more. And you'll get more because it's his word, not mine. And so that's why you should just keep going back. Especially if, you, if, if you've gone a long time since you've listened to something. Go, keep track of what you've listened to and when. Keep a little list of it. And then go back to something that's a year ago. You want deeper? Go listen to something you haven't heard in two years. And you'll get, a, it'll be like a brand new teaching. If you haven't listened to it in a year or two or three, and I'm telling you, it'll be like you've never heard it before. You'll think you remember it, you'll be like, wow. Not because I'm impressive, just because that's the way the word works. So I would recommend, you know, keeping a little log. Just date and what teaching you listen to. And then be able to go back. Because that's deeper. The stuff I'm trying to give you now with understanding the above and the below, that's deeper. Trying to get past the mechanics to the emotional stuff, that's deeper. Okay? What deeper do you need? Let's not get all Gnostic. Like the love of knowledge. The deep stuff is dealing with, I don't know, you. Okay? You want to get deeper? Get inside of you and deal with the you part. That's the problem. And by the way, you don't need to understand Greek or Hebrew to do that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's all Greek to me. All right? Just got to look in that mirror and start dealing with and owning stuff. That's deeper. All right? Okay? All right, this is the afterburn, which I already started for the last... Three minutes. So if you have a comment or question, you can raise your hand. Steve's got the mic. If you're on live stream, Rob's got the live stream desk. Who's going to get us started? Okay, surprisingly, Mr. Steve has well, a question. Well, uh, sure I had your hand, but you went off on this little thing, and I wanted to kind of add, if you don't mind. That's okay. Let me write it. Okay, because it kind of touched you, talked about the heart, and that's where I went with it. It said, making us understand if we are being brought through experiences to increase our understanding, then we then we don't need to check, don't we need to check our heart before we build on what we use for our foundation, which will build our, un, which we build our understanding on? Because if we get down to it, it's us that has to be corrected, not anything else. Amen. Hmm? Amen. No, sure. Amen. <laughs> and by the way, we, we covered it, I, an entire seven verses today. Yay! <laughs> it's a long way to verse 176. That's all I'm saying. <laughs>
This is what we did in the heart of the matter, too. We went, I don't know how many parts going through one nine, Psalm 119. Shira. And by the way, that's another point, just to, just to clear. If you, we went through the entire psalm from a totally different perspective in, in the heart of the matter teaching. We're going through the exact same psalm from a totally different perspective. Look at how much different and additional stuff we're getting out of it. Because you can go back now to the seven or eight or ten parts of the heart of the matter that I covered Psalm 119 and say, oh, because that was looking at it from a totally different point of view. And look at all the different things that we could pull out of the same psalm going through it again and again and again. Okay, Shira. Thank you so much, Rabbi Steve. I am really on fire with what you were teaching today, and um, you probably saw me wiggling around in my seat. I like to be really transparent. This is testimony time. Um, last night I had a, a bad dream, and it was basically, uh, I think Father was pulling up memories from my past of abuse from leadership in my past. And this morning when I went to prayer, Father led me to Psalm 84, and I was reading in verse 4, Blessed are they that dwell or live in your house. They will ever be praising you or continually praising you. And my mind just went, okay, dwell in thy house. I, I want to dwell in your house, but I don't live in Jerusalem, and this isn't, you know, the time of David, how can I dwell in your house? And he spoke to my heart and he said, you are dwelling in my house. What do you think this past Sukkot was all about? And a lady from South Africa poloed me and said, Shira, I would like you to tell me if you found any difference having a feast on your own property than all these other places. And boy, I, I'm going to have a whole lot to share with her. <laughs> because a house, Father was speaking to me, a house, it's a, it's a structure that holds a family, and it's under a headship. Amen. And we are in the house. We are in the house. Amen. <laughs> And how many here have been testifying and saying, this Sukkot was different. We weren't under anybody else's property, authority, a cross, a steeple, uh, you know. We were here in what Father has established through our Nasi and all of the ones who are in leadership beside him. And I, uh, this is a personal part, okay? Uh, some of you may have heard me testify before, along with other ladies, how wonderful it is to be under rabbi's covering as single ladies. Well, at Sukkot, um, I came to Sukkot having had several weeks of a very wonderful phone relationship with, um, I'm Larry's friend, this is... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, greeted, I greeted Shira this morning. I said, hi, Larry, and hi, Larry's friend. <laughs> if you weren't at Sukkot, you didn't understand. Yeah. Larry's like, I, I, I am Larry. Everybody refers to me as Shira's friend. So I started doing it the other way. So. <laughs> and I knew this Sukkot would be a, a really powerful time because it's one thing to have a relationship on the phone and another thing to be face-to-face. -face. And near the beginning of Sukkot, this wonderful man took it on his heart to invite me to come with him and put our relationship under Rabbi Steve. Amen. And I can't even begin to tell you the blessing that was, even just one week of doing our homework, and we're still working on it, but <laughs> Father, so blessed that, and so blessed his wonderful counsel to us and his loving support that by the middle of the week, Father used um, the beautiful spiritual thing that was blossoming between um, Larry and myself to bring about um, an amazing healing of, of years and years of, of being 
bottled up because of a birth trauma, never having really known, never having experienced what it is to have my heart completely open to somebody. And he opened my heart to this beautiful man. Amen. And I know it's because we, we put ourselves under the structure. Amen. In the house. Amen. I, I, I hope, hopefully I'm not overstepping by saying this, but you know, some of the things that you need, need to happen in a safe place. And they can't happen until you feel that you're in a safe place. And so if you're in a house and you're in a structure and you feel safe, then things like opening up a heart that has been damaged to opening up or has been abused in some way or, or is afraid to open can happen because you have to have that safe place. And so I'm very very moved to know that there are those of you that are understanding and finding this. There are people out there saying that this is not safe, but those of you that have experienced and tasted of it understand that this is a safe place. And so I appreciate that very much, and I was very blessed to do that. By the way, let there be a, a very strong testimony to all of you, because I know we've talked about this at times. If you are going to go in the direction of a relationship, you do not want to go into a relationship unless both of you are under the same covering. That is pure foolishness, okay? Now notice I didn't say you had to be under me, but you need to be under the same covering. So the idea that you know they were able to decide together and that he made, the, made it clear that he wanted to also come with her under this authority, that said a lot to her about him, okay? And so, because he knew when he came here that she already was covered by me. But that has to be a choice that he had to make on his own. But that's all for all of you. You may meet somebody and think, oh, I might be interested in a relationship with that person. But you, you really need to find out where are they in the structure. Because the structure cannot help you unless you're both in the structure. Okay? Because some of you have spouses that are not in this walk and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I can only help you so much because only one of you is here, okay? And so if you're not in a relationship that ended up in a marriage, so you do have those options to be with or not be with, I would not go and commit to anything unless both are in the same structure. It's just brutally hard to do, and there's nobody to help in the way they would need it to be helped, because you're going to have challenges. Everybody does. But what a comfort to know that you both can go under an authority and say, we're struggling with something, we need your help, and we're both ready to listen. And that's just a completely different thing. And so there's another piece that you also would have as you're approaching whether or not you should you know, get into a more permanent relationship, knowing that, well, we're at least, if anything is a challenge, we are under the same covering. And so we have that, to that, you know, to that together. So thank you for sharing that. I'm very excited for you know, that <laughs> testimony. And I'm very glad that you got that release from that, that you were able to fully experience something. That's just fantastic. Okay, who's next? You have another one, Steve? Yeah. See what happens? You give a guy a microphone and then... I wanted to kind of cover something that's on the list here, but you talked about trusting in the teacher and who you're under covering. I wanted to point out something. Uh, I had a thought. Let me see if I can share... Um, Let's see if I can get this right, because now it's changed. See, we see actions in others that's not related to the teacher that we attribute to our teacher, and to me, that's wrong, and we got to stop that. Rabbi Steve is a human, and to me, in many cases, you guys see him tease me, and we have our own relationship for what it is. It's mine and his, and nobody knows it. So I want to point out that we need to stop holding what somebody else did, whoever does something. Maybe somebody does something to me and hurt my feelings. I can't attribute that to him or M2I because it was that person. And if that person has a struggle with me, whatever it is, then it's that person. I can't attribute it to him. Nor can I let that person struggle with whatever it is affect my walk with Abba or with Rabbi. So, because I learned of another person who chose not to come today because of somebody else's cho actions and now they're attributing it to Rabbi. And to me, I want to tell people out there, stop it, man. It's not his fault. It's 
that person that whatever it was, it's just you guys stop. And he's the guy. You, to me, he's I'm under his covering, and yes, we're gonna be talking with him later today too. So I mean, stop. stop. I mean. All right, let, let, me, let me say two things real quick with that. One is, he says about trusting the teacher. It's not about trusting your teacher. It's about trusting that Yahweh put that person there. You're trusting Yahweh, not the teacher. Okay? Okay, so I don't need you to trust me. But I'm asking you, are you trusting him that somebody is in a position of authority? Because then you're trusting him, not the human being. Okay? Let's be careful with that. The second thing is that I think is important, you know, when you see a relationship, look, there are a few people, not many, who I tease and poke at and have fun with. And you'll notice I don't do that with everybody, and that's because I have a relationship that if they had a real problem with it, they would tell me, and we have fun, and we enjoy that level of it, and it's okay, all right? I know you're laughing over there. <laughs> all right? And... We, we all enjoy the lightheartedness of it, and you guys know it comes from love, okay? Especially if it's a joking, teasing type of thing, because I don't pick on everybody that way because it's a relational thing. Because I know they can't handle it, but you can, and we have that relationship, and we all laugh and have a good time with each other. We're not laughing at anybody, but we're laughing together, okay? So if you're watching that, some of you think like, man, he's so, that's so mean to that. Well, you don't know the relation. That's what Steve was trying to say. You don't know the relation. By the way, just because I have it with him doesn't mean you can do it. Okay? You have, to, you have to have your own relationship and know where that relationship is. Because that person may not respond to you the same as they do to somebody else because you don't have that level of relationship. All right? And so just kind of keep that in mind. Because I know that sometimes people come to you saying, are you sure that so-and-so is okay with that? I said, that's our relationship and that we worked that out. And I'm always monitoring, engaging. Are they just sort of, ha, 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 ha? Or are they genuinely laughing because they're having, they're having fun with the same fun that we're all having, okay? And so that's, there's a difference and you have to be sensitive to that. So I appreciate that very much. Okay, um, go ahead. Uh, shalom, Rabbi. Shalom. I don't even know how to start this. Um, one start, of the words, start by putting the mic. One of the words that kept uh, ringing true, and as you were as you were speaking, was the word teach. Um, and in verse one twenty four, David says, "Teach me uh, the ability to be teachable." I'm going to be a little transparent. When I first started listening to you, my wife and I, what three years ago or so, I had a hard time with you. <laughs> a very difficult time, in fact. Um, I've experienced a lot in my life. Uh, 10 years in the military, martial arts as well. And being teachable is difficult. I had to empty my cup so that you could fill it. And as time went on, you kept popping up on TV, on the screen, and my wife said, just kind of sat back and prayed, of course. And then the light bulb went on, and then I couldn't get enough. And then we ended up here. So I thank you uh, for your leadership, for your honesty, for your candor, because it's exactly what I need. And being teachable is, is priority. Um, I shared an acronym with you a while back. I don't know if you remember. I'm hot for Yah. Got to be humble, obedient, and teachable. So Amen. I thank you. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that very much. Anybody else? Okay, Ati. Uh, my question was just to if you could just elaborate on the part where you're talking about how we are all to follow and lead, but what does leading look like if you don't have a child or if you're not, like, is that, did you refer to those leading, like, within the family leading or? No, no, it, it talks um, about, is it, what I'm talking about is when you find yourself with those that you are responsible for. You may in life have time when you are not responsible for anybody but you. But if at some point Abba gives you those that you're responsible for, okay, that can be a class you're teaching. That could be like, you know, with the children's program or something. That could be if you are giving your own children, if you get married and have children. It could be whatever it is when you have people that you were responsible for. So it didn't have to do with the fact that you have to be leading and you have to be following. You have to be following because that's something by default you have to find that place in the structure. If he gives you those that you are responsible for, then you have to understand how to do that as well. So now you're training for that when it ever comes up. 
In other words, you're training for the time when you may have those that you're responsible for. Okay, so even if you're not at the moment, at some point you will. Abba will give you a chance and an opportunity to have responsibility. You know, it could be even like the, the older ladies. It says in Scripture, you have a, a potential responsibility if younger ladies come to you for guidance to help teach and instruct them. Not that you need to go up to the younger ladies and impose yourself, but some of them may come up to you and say, hey, I noticed that you're, you really understand this walk, and I would love to have somebody to mentor me in how to be successful as a woman in this walk. Okay? So this is about preparing for an opportunity when you are responsible. Okay, so I'm not saying you have to be. So don't look for, well, if I'm supposed to be, who am I supposed to do this with? I get that. That's a good question. But one day you will have people that you're responsible for, and now you're learning how to do it. Okay, who's next? All right, Billy. I wasn't going to say nothing, but. <laughs> one of the people Steve. I tease relentlessly. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I just want to say uh, I really appreciate uh, Rabbi Steve and Rebbitson. Julie and Rebbitz and Joanne and Rabbi Tom, their leadership, not only working here, but in the ministry itself and coming through Sukkot. Um, after Sukkot, many people came up to me and they were asking how or why I do what I do. And so when Steve mentioned that, a serving, and Rabbi mentioned serving, I always tell them, I have a heart to serve. I'm a servant. It's not that I'm a shamish, because I'm not. It's not that I'm a shepherd, because I'm not. And we may have, I may have those attributes, but I simply serve. When I first came to Sukkot, I went to Rabbi and I asked what could I help him with. After I met him, I met him in a counseling, as many of us did, and then I asked, could I help him? And he said, no, I have everything I need, I'm good. So I turned to walk away and said, you know what? My shoulder's been bothering me. How about carrying Max? So from that day, two years ago, until today, I still continue whenever the chance arises to carry Max and to just be there to serve. Well, they don't know who Max is. It's his bag. <laughs> his, 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 his second part of him is his bag. <laughs> and Max has gotten lighter. He's lost some weight. But anyway, I simply are, made myself available to serve. Whatever he needs, whatever Robinson needs, I remember hearing at one of the, the picnics that Rebison was saying to Rabbi, why is, not that she was concerned or worried, but she said, why is Billy standing there? That's not something Rabbi asked me to do. He's never asked me to really do anything for him. I'm just there to be available to serve in any way that I can. And it's just because I'm there and made myself available, Abba will have him use me or Rebison use me or Rabbi or Rebus and Joanne to use me because I'm available. So I say that to all of the people that think it's some special group or some special favor or, or leadership thing or that or the other, as Greg did wonderfully, now I'm pointing him out, um, during the feast, he was available to serve, and that's what he did. And coming from the heart of a servant, it doesn't matter what Rabbi says, you know, I had, from a counseling this week, I had a question, and I went into Rabbi's office, and I said, Rabbi, I know you're my boss, but before he was my boss, he was my covering, um, and then in leadership, he's our Nasi, and so I was wondering, because somebody asked me <laughs> in the counseling, and I said, Rabbi, you're still my covering, right? And he said, of course I'm your covering. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just be encouraged, you know, all those out there on TV right. land who, YouTube land or whatever, that... Uh, see rabbi and thinks, I don't know why they would think that, that they don't want to call, they don't want to get counsel. Guess what? I work here. I'm in leadership. I still counsel with him. He still corrects me. I still have a humble heart. I'm still serving. It doesn't matter what my title is. All that it matters is I'm where Yahweh wants me to be. I believe in serving who Yahweh has given me to serve, which is the body. Amen. Amen. And, and somehow in all of that, you rejoice, rejoice. All right, that's an inside joke. All right. <laughs> he does. He rejoices. Okay. Um, for those of you wondering, what's this weirdness with Max and this whole thing? Look, I've got a canvas sort of messenger bag that I put all my stuff in, my folders and all the other things that I carry around with me. And because it's a canvas bag, I don't like to put it on the floor like at restaurants and stuff because it'll get whatever's on the floor on it. So I've gotten a habit of always putting it in a chair near where we're sitting so it takes up a chair. 
So Mammy thought that if it had a chair, it should have a name. Okay, so my original bag he called Fr Jeff. He called it Jeff. And I didn't really love the name, whatever, but then I ended up getting a new bag, and I, so I named it Max. So anyway, but I have to tell you, the, 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 the part that was for me in all this is that I like to do my own stuff. I like to carry my own stuff. I like to put my own, so to, to have somebody, it was weird and uncomfortable for me to let him show up and take my bag and carry it for me. And I had to get okay with that because I understood that it blessed him and it gave him an opportunity to do something. But it, he knew it wasn't because I wanted it to be done. I was like, the first couple of times I was like, I can carry my own bag. But he wanted to carry it, okay? And he wanted to do that. And I had to learn to allow someone to serve in that capacity, okay? That wasn't easy in the beginning, all right? You know, of course, now I can tease him when he doesn't show up and I had to carry my own bag. It's like, where were you? And, you know, it's like, come on, man. I had to carry my own bag. <laughs> and then I'd remember, rejoice, rejoice. Okay, so. Anyway, the praise team understands that joke. Okay, so, who's next? <laughs> All right, Christine. So I wasn't going to say anything either. <laughs> but uh, so I have a couple things, and uh, I hope it comes out and makes sense. Um, so as you were talking, I realized, or the thought kind of continued to surface in my mind how, you know, I get to be in that middle position where you're my leader and my rabbi and my boss, but then I get to be a little mini leader to my teachers and the children under me. And I say that humbly. Um, and so I've just been thinking about that as you're speaking. And, um, and that means a lot. And, and just thinking about um, Safety, to me, is a big deal, you know? I, um, you know, I take self-defense classes and other things that go along with that, and um, I try to keep my kids and my teachers safe, and so safety means a lot to me. And when situations arise where I have to seek safety for myself, um, I just, I found myself listening to your teaching last week, talking about um, King David's, you said King David actually needed a hiding place. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he says that throughout all of his Psalms, all the time. And Psalm 27 is one of my favorite, you know, whom shall I fear? You know, Yahweh's a hiding place. And um, I just find it extremely comforting that I can reside in this structure and in this house, well, Shear's not over there, but in this house where I am safe under his leadership, but also in Yahweh's word. And so when I'm reading now and I, I see the, the concept of a hiding place, it's a whole new picture for me. Um, and also, um, as I was going through this Psalm 119 during Shavuot, I got curious about the meaning of the different letters. And so I just jotted down the meaning of all of them according to this rabbinical book that I have. And um, so, and you can correct me if I misunderstand it, but for pay, it's speech and silence, kind of a, a dual meaning. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting because here I am in this dual role where I get to be silent under his leadership and then I get to speak in my little mini leadership. <laughs> and, um, but then also how King David is perhaps displaying that same idea where, where he's got that same leadership going on, where he has to be silent and listen to Yahweh so that he can understand, but then so that he can speech, speak and be the leader for Israel. And um, to wrap this up, in verse 131, he says, for I have longed for your commandments, and I added the punctuation mark of a comma and wrote, because it provides safety and shalom. 
And then on verse 133, it says, establish my footsteps by your word. And I made a little note, kind of what this means to me is, because this is my prayer um, as I work with the teachers and kids, is that I would... So when I saw the word footsteps, I thought, oh, well, that's the way, the path. You're walking in the path. Uh And so my prayer is that I would walk in his ways as a leader, my little mini leader, (laughs) (laughs) and um, that my decisions and my thinking would be worthy of his blessings. Amen. Amen. Let, let, me, let me throw something out there that came up this week that I think fits into what she was talking about to help bring some clarity. Okay, so three, first of all, all confusion gets really fixed by reality. The more reality you can bring into something, the more it clarify, clarifies all the confusion. Can we agree with that? Okay. Problem is that we don't always know what's reality because we've been in a delusion so long that we think what, you know, something that's a delusion is reality. But So here's some of the realities that go along with this whole vertical thing. The vision, the vision, okay, so I don't want to hear the wrong word. The vision starts at the top and goes down, okay? It comes from the top and it gets shared down, okay? You do not have the vision go up, okay? So So if you're in a situation, unless the person above you is asking for input, you're still having to understand that the vision comes down. Anywhere that you are downstream from the vision, your primary function is implementation. You're not there to creatively own it, take it into a different direction, or do something else with it. You're there to implement the vision. Okay? The father gave all that to the son. The son said, I only do what he says to do and only teach what he says to say, and etc. I only do that. And so that vision, which is the father's, The son is then shared, and he's part of the implementation process. And then he trained disciples to do what? Implement that vision, okay? Who then went out and trained more, and the word spreads, et cetera. Now, so just realize that that also works in the family. The husband or the father has the vision. The wife is supposed to help implement that vision with the children, and that should also then be in line with the leadership, who's then in line with the verses and the words and all the way. So that vision still coming from above about the family. Same thing happens like in my relationship with Christine. Christine is the director of the school. It's my school, but it's his school. You understand what I'm saying? He gave me a vision that we should have a school many, many years ago that education was supposed to be a part of this. She has a vision also for education, but she has to make sure that that vision doesn't accidentally, well, let me say it again, accidentally interfere with my vision. And we've had some challenges with that, as always you do. This is kind of the realities I want to bring into this. So you're the person with the vision. You start to recognize that you cannot do it yourself. Okay, Moses was told this. The father isn't doing this himself. He chose to do this with human beings. So he chose a leadership person who then would have other leadership people, and we see how the model of the structure goes. But you also have to realize that once you share that vision and you realize you can't do it all yourself, you have to then do it with other people, that other people who are flawed human beings are going to do things that are not exactly the way you might want it with the vision. Okay? So that's the three things. One is you can't do it yourself. Two is you need to then go ahead and give it to other people. And three is they're going to have moments where they think they're doing what you want in your vision, but they're going to take their own in an unintentionally, uh, you know, usually unintentionally, and go in a different direction a little bit, which is why correction still has to come from above where they say, I get it, but that's not what I wanted, okay? Now, the problem is most of you couldn't handle that conversation, where you put all this work into something and you get all excited about it only to find out that the person above you says, but that's not what I wanted. Okay, and then you get all offended and hurt because you put all this effort in. But if you're going to be anywhere downstream from the vision, you should do number one, here's gonna help you, this is a big lesson. Always, whether you're the wife, whether you're in a structure that's a, 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 an employment structure, anywhere you're downstream from the authority, you always should ask the one above you when you go to do something, this question. Is this what you wanted? Is this what you want? 
okay? If you ask that question all, I mean, as much as you can, as, you know, without being annoying, if he says, well, I gave you the test, just do it, but you want to ask the question, is this what you want? That'll keep you out of trouble because it also helps you remember whose vision you have, how much autonomy you were given, okay? Now, you may have been given very clear guidelines in written form, and then you can go by that. But if anything is unclear and you want to make a decision, you should always go up and say, just to be clear, I want to make sure I'm going in the right direction with this. This is where I want it to go. This is what I was thinking. Is that what you want? Does that look like the way you want it to look? That'll keep you out of trouble, and that's important because the, the person at the top had to get people to help, and the helpers are going to do it mostly the way you want, but not always. And so that conversation needs to be able to, A, you have to be able to take it when they come down and say, hey, but that wasn't what I wanted. That doesn't mean they're mad at you. Don't get ashamed. Don't feel, you know, this is where our emotions get in the way. Now, Christine and I do this really well. Because I sometimes will have to say to her, this is not what I wanted. And then she'll be able to say, okay. And she doesn't get offended. And she moves on and she takes it well. That works well. Not everybody can do that, though. It took time to get there. <laughs> okay, well, okay. <laughs> but, you know, but part of the problem was that you had a vision before I gave you this opportunity of a school you wanted to do the way you wanted to do it. And you were hoping someday to do it. And then you brought that vision underneath. And once you bring your vision underneath somebody else's, you're going to have to submerge yours under theirs. And that's hard. Okay? But you've done that well, all things considered, okay? But I have to say, there's a lot of you out there. There are people back a few years back, you guys wouldn't know them, they're not here anymore, long gone, but the point is, they used to say, how come you mention all the time you need help, but you don't let me help you? I want, because I know that you're gonna mess it up, like everybody does at some point, and then when I go to correct you, you're gonna just absolutely turn into a puddle of mush. And you're gonna quit, and you're gonna cry, you're gonna be upset. You as the leader, this is part of that three points that I want to make. If you're the leader and you realize you have to share this with other people to do it, have to recognize they will mess it up on some level. Don't get upset about it. It's going to happen. At some point, they're not going to do what you wanted the way you wanted. That's a reality you have to accept. So don't get upset about it. It's going to happen. However, if you're the one down line from it, you have to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I can't be offended when the person above me says, that's not what I wanted. What are you doing? I didn't authorize that. That wasn't the way I wanted it to be. Oh, but I was just trying to help. <laughs> I get that you were trying to help. So nobody should be mad at you. I just wanted to make sure that you understand that isn't what I had in mind. And so you can't get your emotional investment in it to cause you to be upset. These are really important life lessons to apply everywhere in your life, okay? You're always in some sort of structure somewhere. If you have a job, you're either the boss or you're under the boss. And so if you're the boss, you have the realities of that you can't do it all yourself. If you're under the boss, you're now part of the implementation system of the boss's vision. And you have to recognize that you're there for one reason, to make that vision come out into reality. And then you can't do it all yourself, so you may have another level under you. And so you need to communicate, not your vision, but your the above, the vision has to be continuously. It's like the telephone game, you know, where you have those people tell each other different things, and you have to make sure there's no altering or changing of the message from the person above you as you transfer it to the person below you. If Yeshua got the message clean from the Father and gave it to us clean, and then we've had people throughout history muddy it up, okay? And that's where it gets all problematic. And so you have to make sure, I want to make sure that the one above me, I, do I get your message? Is this is what you want? Is this what you want? Is this how you want it? I need to know so I go ahead and do it. Okay? And then you go and do it, but if you need help below you, make sure you transfer. This isn't my vision. This is the one above me's vision. This is what we need to do because this is what that person wants. Okay? And in the vertical structure of Scripture, it all has to align with what the Father actually had in mind. What did he have in mind? What did he want? What was his vision? Okay? And no, he does not give that to the individual. He passes it down through the structure. Okay? And that's where we all get confused. Everybody wants to feel like he gives them the direct download and the direct vision, and that's just not scriptural. Okay? What he will inspire you is to find the structure so you can get in the structure. 
And then you'll have your place of responsibility on whoever you're responsible for, if you're responsible, and you'll learn how to submit to the above. Christine, you wanted to say something? Stand I was, up. I was just gonna say thank you for everything that you said. And then also what I forgot to say a second ago was that I feel like we've been able to grow so much over the past year in um, our interactions and, and me learning how to be submissive, <laughs> not just to him, but to my husband too. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that and thank you. Amen. And then this is why I find Shalom. So. Amen. Look, and by the way, I had to learn to do the Moses thing. What I mean is I had to learn to delegate and trust someone, because I always did everything myself, okay? But then it got too big. It was a Moses moment. I'm not claiming to be Moses, but you understand it was a, it's a like kind. We learned the lessons by looking at the wonders. Well, I needed to realize I can't do this all myself, so I have to trust people. And if I trust them, they're not going to always do what I wanted. And by the way, sometimes when they do it on their own, it ends up being great. And I still may come up to them and say, that wasn't the way we're supposed to do this, but I love it. It's great. Right? Okay. It happens. And sometimes they're like, oh, but he still told me. I did. But no, it's okay. We just need to know there's a right way to do it. And just because it worked doesn't always mean that we shouldn't just have someone point out, by the way, I'd rather you do it this way, even though what you did was great. Okay? And so, because often the inspired people that you are inspired to put in that structure do great because that's why you want them there. But you still, they got to learn because if they learn to get too independent, then it can really go sideways quickly, okay? Sometimes it won't always be great. And the thing is, it's not that terrible things will happen, but then you'll have to correct them in a more strong way, and that's when things go bad. Because most people do not take correction well, especially not from a very red person, okay? It comes across too harsh, too blunt, too whatever, even though that's not necessarily intended. And so, you know, and that's why I told the person who like said, I said, but listen, if I, if I were to ask, because you know, people want to volunteer to do stuff. If you volunteer, you better think about, can I take correction if I volunteer and I do something that somebody may say to me, hey, but that's not what I wanted. Or why are you doing that? Nobody told you to do that. Oh, but I just saw this thing and I went to go do it. If you can't handle that, then you need to not volunteer yet. Or you need to volunteer knowing that you need to learn how to handle it. Okay? Because that's part of our maturing and growing. And I had to learn how to talk to people when they didn't do things the way I wanted it done. And I didn't talk very nicely in the beginning, okay? I've gotten better at that because I had no experience with it, okay? And so I appreciate Christine's comments that, you know, over time, that's gotten better. But it's challenging. And she'll learn to do the same thing with her teachers. She shares that vision from me to them and they're not always going to do it exactly the way she said or the way I had wanted. And then she might have to correct them. And then the same thing then how it goes to the students. And then you walk in the classroom and you go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing what you said. That's not what I wanted. What do you mean it's not what you wanted? I put all this effort into developing this. You can't take it personally. What you have to say is, that's not what you wanted? Great, tell me what you want so I can fix it. Own it, fix it, because you just want to make it right and not take it like, oh, well, do you know how much work I put into that? It doesn't matter how much work you put into that. It's not what the person wanted, it's not what they wanted. Okay? Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. Yeah, but it's not what I wanted. You did what you wanted. It doesn't matter that you did all these, oh, we did all this stuff. It's the wrong stuff. So don't be upset about it. Be excited about fixing it, making it right. That's all. No big deal. All right, who's next? Okay, Rabbi Tom. Thank you. Uh, several times in 119, uh, David, even though he, he, he was the king of Israel, refers to himself as a servant. And uh, in the chain of command, of course, the prophet is always higher than the king. I came across a verse in, in second. Uh, Kings chapter 3 verse 11 that, that shows that just one example where although the prophets were pretty high up uh, in the echelon uh, they also were servants and they started out as servants it says and Jehoshaphat said is there no prophet of Yahweh here 
then let us inquire of Yahweh through him. And one of the servants of the sovereign of Israel then answered and said, Elisha, son of Shephat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Eliyahu. So that shows that Elisha started out as a, as a humble servant washing the hands of Eliyahu. Amen. So I have a, I have a question. Then. You mentioned implementation. Would it be fair to say that through this act of washing someone's hands, a simple act, that Elisha was really implementing uh, the vision of Eliyahu? Well, look, he was showing himself there to be ready, willing, and able to do whatever. Ready and willing, yeah. Okay? In other words, some of you have in mind what it looks like when you say, I want to serve, and then we say, well, we need you to go clean the toilets or put out the garbage or some other thing. You're like, well, no, no, no. Do you have something else for me to do? Well, I mean, do you want to just serve, or did you have an agenda of your own? Okay, so apparently Eliyahu needed his hands washed, whatever that meant in a metaphor. I don't know if it even was literal. And Elisha was there to do that, okay? Okay, so it has to do with I'm here for whatever. See, there are a lot of people that come here, and some of you who come here just show up to be available. That's what Billy said he was doing. I'm available. And they would show up. And guess what? If you're here and you're available, there's stuff to do. And we'll give you stuff to do. And you may or may not like it. It may not be exactly, who knows? Some people love the kind of work that, you know, some, some of you like to pack up chairs and, and put them on a truck or unload them and put them out on the floor. Or some people think that, well, I don't want to do all that. But if you're here and you're available, there's stuff to do. Others come here and they get all frustrated and then they leave because whatever they expected to happen here didn't happen. You know, I've got people that in the past have been like, well, why didn't you call me? I would have helped. So we'll call you, why don't you come here? There's always something to do. That literally happened. It's like, where were you? Well, I didn't know. Why didn't you call me? Why well, not to call you? We don't know your schedule. You got time and you're available, show up. Trust me, there's always something to do. We'll find something for you to do. But that's when you show up. And by the way, and if you show up and we don't have something for you to do, that's okay. At least you showed up. Keep showing up. I mean, that's what it's about. And then, you know, I got two people that are on staff now because they just kept showing up and doing stuff, and I realized what they were doing was worth paying them for. You know, George and Billy, okay? I didn't, they didn't come here because we had a job for them. But they kept showing up and just doing and showing up and doing. I'm not saying if you show up and do, you'll just get hired. I'm just saying, but just show up. If that's what you want to be available to do something, be available to do something. And you don't know where it's going. Next thing you know, Elisha's being elevated into a position because he was there serving and doing. Okay? So think of that. There's a great metaphor. It's a great thing that you know, Rabbi Tom pointed that out. Look, again, for you guys who want it deeper, this is deeper. Everything I teach you is not about interesting. It's about applying it in your life today. Everything I teach should be something you can use today. Well, I haven't learned nothing from you. Then you're not paying attention. You're not ready to make those changes in your life. You're not ready to apply this in your life today. There is no way you could have listened to today and got nothing out of it that you can't, you could apply it today. Okay? And I don't hear a lot of teachers, this is not, again, bragging about anything on me. I'm, I'm disappointed that there are few and far between teachers that teach stuff for today to apply in your life now. I'll teach you about what the book was talking about and so you can understand through the nuances and the Hebrew and the this or the, the culture. But what about now? What, what do I do with that? I want you to know what you can do with the word. David's talking about how the word and his understanding of it affected everything he did. It empowered him. It gave him understanding and wisdom. It helped him to live life right. I think the teachers are doing a lousy job out there of not teaching that way. They're not teaching you how to take the word and use it and live it and be it. And that's what we try to do here, okay? That's why I don't teach all the stuff that you want me to teach because it's interesting, okay? I'm not concerned with interesting. I'm concerned with application of transformation. What can you do to transform into his image? 
And that's everything that we try to do is, this is what he said, and the purpose of it is to transform you. So let's work with that, amen? Amen. Okay, who's next? Okay, live stream. Okay, from Pete and Brenda Lamb. It says, could you, okay, Rabbi, could you uh, compare, or please ask Rabbi on comparing Psalm 119, verse 130, to John 1, verses 4 and 5. Oh, they, they tie in very nicely. Okay, so John, 4, John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Which is the teaching, Yeshua, the light of the world, and it's also the teaching, dark, you know, darkness and light. Okay? And so in verse 130 of the psalm, it says, The opening up of your words gives light. And so when you see the word word, you think about the truth, you think about the Torah, you think about Yeshua. Okay? I mean, I've tried to teach you to amplify, not like the Amplified Bible, but to amplify when you see any of those words, the word word, light, life, the way, the truth, Yeshua, all of those things should come to mind every time you see any one of those words, okay? So if you see the word life, you should think about the word, the way, the truth, Yeshua said. When you see the word light, you should think about the other words. So go, all of those words go together as a full understanding of the depth of what's trying to be said. Okay, next. Okay, uh, from, there's a couple on here kind of related. It says, Rabbi, can you, from Tammy Cartwright, can you speak a little more about how to learn to trust in authority and leadership after bad experiences? And Pamela says, what about when you submit to authority, but they ignore you when you needed their guidance? That's my fear of submitting or submitting again. Okay, look, there's only one way to do this. You have to taste it. I know you've had bad experiences. We've been abused. We've been ignored. We've been taken advantage of. We've been meddled with. We've been belittled. We've been, I don't know, every negative word you can think of that can come from an authority figure. So how do you learn to trust one? You got to try First, you, actually, you know what? There's a step one before that. You have to believe it's right. You have to believe what Paul says in Ephesians 4 about leadership, that you need these guys in order to be perfected or come into the fullness of integrity so that you can fully conform and transform into the fullness and completeness that is Messiah. So you first have to believe and trust that it's correct and necessary. Then, if you believe that it's correct and necessary, you have to believe that it actually exists in other words, those people exist right now on this planet and they're available to you. Then you have to go look for them and be willing to taste. In other words, you have to give it a chance. You heard Christine, you've heard Shira, you've heard others say that some of these things came from, well, they gave it a chance. They did it. They came and they did it. See, most of you, most of you, I'll point to the camera, most of you only hear and see this then there are a few of you who've come and counseled a few times. Then there are others of you like Billy who get to be here day, like all day long, all day through, and they watch and see what I do, how I handle people, how I treat people, the provision that I give to them, the correction that comes, the love and compassion and mercy that's there, the generosity that's there. He's also seen it on a level that some of the other staff doesn't because he's in training, and so he comes into some of the council sessions, and he sees and observes and how that goes. If you've never done it, you don't know. All you know is this, the teaching and the afterburn. You don't know. And so the only way to know is the taste of it. You have to try. And through so trying it and tasting of it, then you'll know. So we say, well, how can I learn to do it? You can't unless you try it. And so take, you know, take your big toast, dip it, you know, stick it in the water there and just kind of Test the waters out a little. You have, but you can't do that by just watching a video. Make a phone call. Set up an appointment. Have a conversation. Show up. Come here and meet. Spend that time. Look, you guys out there watching have no idea, but services will end. We're going to eat. And then guess what happens right as soon as we finish eating? I counsel for like three hours. Because you might think, oh, you know, service is over, the rabbi's job is done. No, people are going to want to talk to me. So I have a list, and we make a list, and people come, and we sit, and we talk. And I'll do that until 10, 11 o'clock at night on Saturday night every week, okay? And sometimes those council sessions are with people in other countries. I've got one scheduled tonight. 
So I'll have to actually go and do that on my computer while we're here in the building. But that's that's the 24/7 availability. That, that that's part of leadership. You want to be in, in you want to be in charge. Well, it's not in charge. You're serving. The burden of responsibility is to be available and to serve. But you're never going to understand until you either a taste of it or you're here watching it. Or if you're talking to those who've tasted of it. And by the way, don't just talk to the squeaky wheels that are going to go blah, blah, blah. Okay? Get perspective. Talk to enough people. Talk to the people that have you've heard give testimony and say, come on, really? Is he really like that? Is that really how it goes? Ask Billy. Ask Shira. Ask others who you've heard give their testimony. Ask Christine. Anybody that said something positive and say, come on, really? Is he really like that? What's it really like to be under that authority and that structure? Ask Waffle, ask Steve, okay? He's gotten some very tough counsel. He's gotten some very compassionate counsel. He's got, I was there when he lost his wife. I was there when he was struggling with other things. I mean, you know, ask somebody who's tasted of it, not just the guys who whatever they want to, because they got their feelings hurt, they want to go ahead and just go blah, blah, blah. All right, Steve? Yeah, I, I want to jump in because you said something. There's been, um, I've been around a little bit with Rabbi, and I want to say that, just because if he makes a mistake, you guys want to run away. Well, there was one incident between me and him that he did counsel, and it wasn't correct, and he owned it, and very humble when he did. And we fixed it, and we're, we're going past that. But to me, it took a pretty big man to say, whoops, I should have done this, and, and, and what he did, it didn't work. So, But I didn't hold him accountable because... You know, I can't expect him to be perfect if I myself am not. So. Okay, look, even, thank you, Steve. Look, even, even with good counsel, life is never a straight line. Now, because we continue to counsel, it continues to be a positive in his life. And so I gave him one counsel. I don't even remember what it was. It doesn't matter. But I gave him something, and I went to say, okay, well, that didn't work. So it's not so much that it was wrong counsel. It just didn't work. I was, this is what I thought would work. It didn't work. Okay? So you can call it whatever you want, but it didn't work. So I said, okay, I own it. It was my counsel and it didn't work. But then we gave more counsel and then, so I'm not expecting everything to always be perfect and you shouldn't either. But in the bigger full spectrum of it, is it helping you go to where you need to go? Okay? There's no expectation that a human being is perfect. I'm a human being. I have a responsibility and a role to play. It's not going to be perfect. All right? But if something seems to go south or sideways, we're going to sit down and talk about it. And then I'll say, okay, well, maybe that didn't work or whatever. I don't remember what it was. So, but I'm sure that whatever he says is true, so I'm not going to argue it at all. I'm just going to say, but notice he didn't run, and he's gotten other counsel since then and other things that have gone well. And this is the way that we have to deal with things, okay? But also, I can tell you without embarrassing him, there was three or four times where something did go badly and it had nothing to do with me. And I was able to sit down and say, Steve... You don't know. You need to fix this and stay and don't quit and come back and, and work this out with whoever it is he was having a problem with. I mean, that's happened a few times, you know, where we can have that emotional meltdown and then you need somebody to be able to say, hey, yeah, I understand. That didn't go the way you wanted it to go. And this, this, this was things that didn't have anything to do with me. But my role was to go as a covering and say, but you need to not quit. Don't go and you know, let me get you off the ledge and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And all of you can have those moments. I've done that with a lot of people. Talk you off the ledge and get you to understand and deal with your stuff and understand that other person that you're dealing with is also dealing with their stuff. Okay? And that's part of it. But you have to taste of it. Okay? There's no other way to do it. So the person who asked the question is a great question. Unfortunately, the answer is you have to step out in faith and trust it. Okay? It's like, let's say you're single and you've either been married before or not, doesn't matter, but you've had relationships that were bad. You are never going to have a good one unless you try again. That's just a fact. You can't possibly have a good relationship if you don't try. If you never have another one, you'll never have a good one. So how are you ever going to have a good one unless you try again? Does it make sense? Well, the same thing with leadership. You're never going to be in good leadership or know you're in good leadership unless you try it. But you have to try it. Okay, Rob? Okay, from Olivier and Janet Hoffman. This is Rabbi in Psalm 119, verse 130. Is this related to the words Yeshua said in Mark 10, 15? Yeah, I'm sure that that could be said. Okay, so in Mark 10, 15, it says, Truly I say to you, if you don't come as a little child, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. So the coming as a simple. That's, you know, when he was talking about being simple. I'm sure that that can be connected. Okay. 
okay, from, from Yanni, uh, related to verse 128. We are to hate the false way. How is this in life without... How is this in life without hating people doing the false way? How do I get in line with Abba and love those who hate him? Because he loved you when you hated him. <laughs> you were at enmity with him. You were an enemy of his. Okay? Now, you may not have thought that you hated him, but by the way, the, the people that, that you're talking about don't actually claim, well, I hate Yahweh or I hate God. They just don't like this walk, and they don't like that you're doing this walk, and they see him differently. Look, it's like you, you hate the sin, but not the sinner. Okay? Though, but, you know, if it wasn't for, as they say, if it wasn't for his popping your bubble, you'd be them. You were them. That's why he says, don't forget you were a slave in Egypt. Don't forget you weren't always walking this way. You, you, you made a, a journey and a transition. They haven't yet. Be merciful. Be compassionate. Don't get all full of yourself. Okay? Yahweh doesn't need you to defend him. Okay? He doesn't need you to do that. Next. Okay, from Philip Mason. It says, Rabbi talked about not attributing things to Yahweh that are not his. Would that be related to Matthew 5, 33 through 37? Also, what should be the appropriate way to address these? Well, I mean, Matthew 5, 30, that, that section is talking about let your yea be yea and your nay be nay and, and talking about making oaths. Um, I don't think that's necessarily what he's talking about here in the psalm. I think he's taking it more the idea of, you know, uh, or what I was talking about at the time of saying, you know, that somebody might say, well, Yahweh led me to do this. Yahweh, you know, don't, don't put his name on something that wasn't his. Okay? So the safest way to do that is you give him credit for every good thing, whether it was his time and chance or him directly, and the other stuff, you recognize that he allowed it or caused it, but you're not going to go and put his name on something. Just own the choice yourself. Okay? So this is, what I was talking about wasn't really the Matthew thing. That was more about making an oath. I was, I was talking more about people, you know, saying, well, Yahweh just told me that I have to leave here. Yahweh told me that. I, you know, I just had a check in my spirit. And all that. Don't, don't be just doing that. You know, you may feel it inside, but I would keep it to yourself. Just feel like, just say to somebody, listen, I just feel like I need to move on, or I just feel like it's time for me to go. Why you feel that way, that's your private business. Whether you feel that Yahweh led you to do it or not, that's nobody else's business. I just feel like it's time for me to go. Okay, I have my reasons. That's better than saying, well, you know, the father, you know, was on top of me and just made it clear I've got to go. Mm, I wouldn't say that out loud. It may be true, by the way. I'm not discounting that it may be true. But what if it's not? Then you're in trouble, okay? So I'm not saying it's never true. But why bring out the possibility that if it's not true, now you just blurted that out there? Okay, next. Okay, from uh, MTOI Urbana. says so Psalm 119, verse 128. Would it be correct to interpret all your orders I count as right would also be extended to the orders given through uh, the Deuteronomy 17 process? I noticed that the your in that verse is in, is in italics. Yeah. Therefore, all orders I count as right. But the, 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 obviously, the idea is that it's not just anybody's orders. But I think that applying it with the Deuteronomy 17 and 18 would be correct. Because in Deuteronomy 17, he says, and when you get that right ruling from those guys that you go to in Deuteronomy 17, and also in 18, it says if you, you would be acting arrogantly not to listen. Okay? Okay. Um... But hold on, this is where we need the subtle clarification that's really not so subtle. It's assuming that you found Deuteronomy 17, 18 people. Not everybody in, quote, unquote, a position of authority is that authority. Okay? Just because they have a position in a congregation that they, you know, they have to literally be of the anointed, appointed Melchizedekian or Levitical or literally the king. Okay? And so that was within that structure that you have to now make sure you're finding somebody that's actually a legitimate leader in that structure, okay? Not because they happen to put something on their business card that says apostle or something, all right? Okay, go ahead. Okay, this one, uh, something I just, I, I tied together, I guess. When you were talking to Kylie in that verse 128, and when we were doing um, Deuteronomy uh, during the uh, Sukkot, something that 
kind of stood out in what you just said is putting the name and people leaving saying that, you know, they don't, not everybody leaves quietly. They want to take as many people with them. And, and that just, I wrote it down. I've wrote it down several times now. And in the notes and here's in Deuteronomy 27, 18, when we were going through the, uh, the, the curses and everybody was saying, I'm in verse 18, it says, curses he who misleads the blind, which is probably the ones that don't have the eyes to see in the way. And uh, then if you go back up to verse 14, it's the Levites, or yeah, the Levites are talking to all the men of Israelites. So those that are probably in the covenant, right? Am I, mm-hmm. am I seeing that right? And so then now they're just trying to, yeah. they're cursing themselves because they want to take everybody else out with them. You know, they're misleading mm-hmm. the blind. Mm-hmm. So. Look, and it says in verse 19, curses you twist the right ruling. Okay, so in other words, if you step into an authority place and you use it incorrectly, you have multiple curses for that. Justin Rodriguez says, question, Rabbi, you spoke in the vertical alignment with parents and children and parents and, and Yahweh. Where does the marriage land in there? And can you explain that proper order and structure? Yeah, and I talked about this in a couple of teachings, I think during Sukkot and before. The proper structure is that in the vertical, you have the husband, then the wife, then the children, okay? Now, of course, if you have husband and wife having no idea how to be husband and wife and how to do their roles, the whole thing's a mess, as you probably know if you're in one of those relationships, okay? If the husband and wife are not properly aligned, the thing doesn't work right. And you know it, because you're in it, and you know it, okay? Whether you're the wife or the husband, if one or both of you is not doing your roles right, it's not going to work right. There's no getting around that. There's no exception to that rule, <laughs> okay? If you're out of alignment, you're going to have issues. Now, the problem is, you can't just go from out of alignment to into alignment if you have no idea how to do it. It's going to take a transitional period, and that could be very bumpy and rough while you're getting there, all right? And some of the ladies are shaking their heads, Yep. I wanted my husband to step up, and now that he's stepping up, I hate it. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. Well, you're gonna have, he's never going to get there unless you support it. You have to encourage it and support it. And guys, you're not going to get there unless you get under a leader who's going to help you to teach you how to do it right. And so, and by the way, there's lots of books and lots of other things out there to teach you how to do this right. If you want recommendations, come see me. I can give you recommendations. But the thing is, you have to study and learn how to be the husband, to be a man, to be in that vertical alignment. I will be doing classes on this at some point, all right? I'm accumulating material for that and trying to put a little curriculum together for it. The same thing for you ladies. If you have no idea how to be a woman or how to be a wife, it's gonna be a struggle. And so we'll have classes for that too. Because we're all doing stuff we were never trained to do. And we've never had good examples to watch. Or we've only had limited examples. Maybe we had one good one here or there, but you know, mostly we've not seen people do it well. We've mostly seen them do it poorly. That's a problem. Because we tend to imitate what we see. All right? So from Helen Thrasher, says, if you try to lead your kiddos, what do you do if they are not wanting to listen and not interested? So how can I engage my 13-year-old son to make it interesting for him? In terms of the vertical stuff? Okay, look, when it comes to the vertical, you cannot push this on your children. What you can teach the children is that in my house, we do this, and while you live in this house, you need to respect that, and I expect your compliance. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to believe what I believe, but you need to respect that this is what happens in this house, okay? And then you can tell them that you're exactly four years and 300 days away from your own choice, okay? Or whatever amount of days they are, 13 plus, okay? I mean, that's the reality, You can't make them get it. What you can do is make them respect that in your house, this is the way things are done. So you can't make them do things. Like, look, you can't force them to pray and sit on them to pray. But you can force them not to, for example, do things on Shabbat that are not Shabbat worthy in your house. So you can't watch certain things. You can't play certain games. In other words, this is the environment that you live in. Here, these are the rules. Okay? Just like if you live in Bradley County, it has rules. If you live in Tennessee, there's rules. If you live in the United States, there's rules. If you live in another country or another town, there are rules. 
And you can't just do whatever you want. If you don't like the rules, you can go move someplace else where they have different rules. Well, when you're 13, you don't have that option. Okay? And so say, look, I get that you don't see things the way I do. I understand that you don't like it and don't agree, but that's too bad. <laughs> okay? Try and be a blessing to them. Try to make it special for them as best you can so that they see a blessing in obedience and show them that you appreciate while they don't agree with you that they're at least trying to be respectful and comply to the rules of the house. Because now it's not about it being Yahweh's rules, it's about being yours. I get that you don't see the vertical, but in this vertical, there's one part you can't get away from. You're in my house still, and you have to be in my house until you're 18. So until then, you're going to need to figure out a way to be okay with these rules. All right? And so that's, you know, because remember, you've got to be preparing them for their own life. And their own, once they walk out your door, they're going to do or not do whatever they want to do or not do. And you are not going to have... Let me rephrase it. You'll have a limited effect on that. They're going to do some of the stuff they're going to have to touch the fire to see it's hot. Hopefully it won't burn them too bad. They're just going to have to figure it out. They're not going to trust you. They think you're an idiot. They're teenagers. They think they know everything. They think you're stupid. They think you're naive. Well, what do you know? I don't know. I've been you. I made all those dumb mistakes. What do you mean, what do I know? You want to see the scars? Dumb kid, right? That's what you're thinking. I'm saying that, you ain't dumb kid. And that's when I smile and say, okay, that's, you know, three years, two months, and four days, and you can go figure out your own thing. Until then, you're in this house. So you need to figure it out. Otherwise, it's going to be a miserable three years and whatever months, and that's it, because this is not your house. That's just the reality. Bring reality into it. Well, I don't believe the way you do. Fine. You don't have to. But this is my house. Okay? And you can't do certain things in my house. You know, that's how it works. Your child grows up. Your child moves out of the house. Your child has a live-in significant other and wants to come over with their significant other and stay in the same room in your house. And you say, not in my house. Oh, but blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't matter. You go stay in a hotel and do what you want to do. That's fine. That's your life. That doesn't happen in my house. Okay? I'm not judging you. You want to do that? That's your life. Okay? I don't agree. It doesn't matter. I don't agree. It's not my life. It's your life. But this is my house. Well, I want to... You're just being... You're judging me. Oh, no, this is my house. You can't do that in my house. Oh, I'm coming over for the weekend. Well, guess what? On Saturday, this is, this is not happening in my house if you're visiting on, on the weekend. It's my house. It's my house, my rules. You don't like it, go somewhere else. You're always welcome in my house, but it's still my house. I don't care you're 40 and have kids and grandkids. Well, it's my house. Okay? You bring them to my house, it's my house. All right? When I come to your house, I will not judge you and impose my things in your house. It's your house. Okay? And if I don't like something in your house, I don't, I, I'll choose not to be there when that's going on. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just a reality of sovereignty. I, am, I have authority over this space. I'm responsible for this space. Outside of this space, I have no responsibility for you anymore. You're an adult. It's your life. Do what you want. Okay? But you can't bring it here. Does that make sense? Are we good? All right? So they can't bring the pork in the house. They can't bring the other stuff in the house. It doesn't come in the house. Oh, you know, but my brother comes to visit and he wants to bring in and start, tell him it's your house. Otherwise, he can stay in a hotel and come and see you. Oh, but he's going to get all offended. Well, it's too bad. Why do you worry so much about what everybody thinks? I don't get that. Maybe it's because I don't have any blue. Okay? I just don't care. All right? All right? Draw those lines. Oh, but he's going to... Why does what anybody else thinks affect what you do? Do what's right because it's right, period, and don't care what everybody else thinks. Is that so hard? Oh, but they're not... Oh, but what is it? Oh, but. Why is there always an oh, but? 
Rabbi, my, my, my daughter's daughter, my grandchild is getting married, you know, on Saturday, and, uh, and if I don't go, they'll never talk to me again. Well, that's sad to know, but so what? <laughs> How can you say that? Because I don't know why that should affect your obedience. Why would you risk your eternal life and everything else because your kid might not talk to you again? They will anyway. They'll get mad for a period of time or whatever, and eventually they'll get over it or not, okay? But who, who, whose feelings, quote unquote, are you protecting? What Yahweh feels about it or what your daughter or son or whatever feels about it? Well, you don't understand. What do you mean I don't understand? Seems to me you're having the problem understanding. I'm not the one who's confused. I'm not the one struggling with a decision. So therefore, I'm not the one that doesn't understand. Well, that just seems so, it doesn't matter what it seems. It's either right or wrong. This is not a very, you know, gray world we live in. Yahweh makes it very clear. There's right and there's wrong. That's it. And so, you can't go. And if you can't go, they may or may not talk to you. They may or may not be offended. They may or not, whatever. Now, if you're smart and you know somebody's dating and they're likely at some point to get married and they're related to you, you may want to say to them, sweetheart, I love you, or to a, whatever it is, to your grandson or your son or your daughter, whatever, say, I love you and I want to be at your wedding. Can you honor and respect me enough to schedule it when I can be there? Instead of them already booking everything and they finally got the place they wanted, then by the way, they invite you and they're like, what do you mean you can't come? Tell them right up front. I want you to know, if you do this, I will not be able to come. Please pick a day I can go to. Ask me before you schedule because I want to be there. I'm your mother. I'm your father. I'm your grandmother, grandfather, whatever it is. I'm your aunt, uncle. I don't care what. If you're close to them and you want to be there. If you, I'd say, look, if you want me there, this is the only way that happens. I cannot break the holy days in Shabbat. And be careful with the holy days, too, because you'll tell them that you can't break Shabbat, and they'll schedule it for a Tuesday, and wouldn't you know that Tuesday's a holy day? So you need to tell them, look, please ask me and check with me. I want to be there. I love you. I want to be there. Okay? If you didn't preemptively set that in there, and by the way, if you told them and they do it anyway, then they can't, then if they say, oh, well, you're not going to come? Well, I told you. So don't get mad at me. We had this conversation. You need to own your part of this. I told you if you did this, I could not come. So why are you mad at me? You didn't have a date when I told you. You picked it after. All right? Well, I didn't know you were serious. <laughs> well, then you haven't walked this thing out right if they don't know you're serious. They should already know how serious you are. My family, Jewish as they may be, keeps nothing. They know I will not break these things. And so when they schedule something and I say, well, you know, you scheduled during this, they were like, now what, my brother's twin girls had their bar mitzvah during Sukkot, their bat mitzvah during Sukkot. Okay? Now, I could have gone to the bat mitzvah, Nothing wrong with that. It's basically just a Sabbath service that the, that the girls were running. But they did it during Sukkot. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't go during Sukkot. I have responsibilities. I'm going to be here. Or at the time we were up in Dandridge or wherever. Okay? But I said, I can't come. So they tried to move it actually for me, but they couldn't move it because of the way they're, the, the temple, the synagogue was already booked with other people doing other things. But they understood. Nobody got mad at me. I said, I can't come. I'd love to come. Can't come. All right? But you know what? They reacted differently because they were not surprised that I wasn't going to compromise or change anything. And by the way, it wasn't because it was on a holy day. It was because I had responsibilities. They know I have this job and this position and that I was going to be, you know, presiding over a Sukkot somewhere. And the same thing with you. If you know you're going to be at Sukkot or Unleavened Bread, you can say, look, I'm sorry. I can't leave that to come do your thing. Even if they're not doing it on a holy day or a Sabbath. I've, I've got a commitment between me and my creator to be at his thing. 
That, that wedding feast and celebration and, re, and, and rehearsal is more important than yours. I'm sorry to tell you that. But that's reality. Okay? I want to be at yours, but it's more important to be at his. Does it make sense to everybody? Amen? Amen. Amen.